Thank you, John, for that generous introduction and for all you do. I stand here today overwhelmed by a powerful range of emotions. Pride in my youngest daughter, Tess, graduating after 13 years of hard work. Tess, I believe, feels a very different emotion thinking about the next 10 minutes, stone cold terror. <laughs> Love you, TFG. I feel enormous gratitude toward Trinity for educating my four daughters in such an exceptional way, not just academically, but as human beings who need to care for one another. As Ms. Mulvahill proclaimed last week, goodness is Trinity's greatness. All the more reason I feel sadness in knowing that our family has reached the last stop on its Trinity voyage. Like the prophetic words of the lower school anthem, roses and cobblestones, one day it ends. No more moving up ceremonies, no more Christmas chapels, no more navigating backpacks in the swamp, no more Randall's Island lacrosse matches rooting for the Tigers, no more tough grades from Miss Munez, she's the best. No more stress-inducing junior year final history papers. No more beautifully written report cards from dedicated Trinity teachers. And never more will my wife, Mindy, after 20 years, walk a daughter across the park to school. But beyond anything, what I feel now is a profound sense of wonder. How did an insecure kid from suburban Chicago find himself in this glorious cathedral with a daunting mission to impart a few words of wisdom to the remarkable Trinity class of 2023. In fact, when I graduated from Highland Park High School in 1988 in a class of nearly 600 kids, you would have been hard pressed to connect the dots from there to here. I was not Mr. Popular, a star athlete, or a model UN captain. My parents divorced when I was six, something that came to define my youth and made me acutely aware that the steady ground can suddenly fall away. What was my most significant childhood achievement? I developed later than all the other kids. On my 16th birthday, I was so excited at that seminal moment of getting my driver's license. For the Trinity graduates, that's a laminated card which allows you to operate a motorized vehicle. Anyway, I drove straight to McDonald's for a celebratory Big Mac and fries, and I can still hear the attendant from the drive through intercom responding loudly, thank you ma'am, please pull around. <laughs> Not surprisingly, I barely made my high school basketball team, which suffered through a humiliating 1-23 and season my junior year, and I was warming the bench. If that weren't enough, my coach nicknamed me and two of my smaller teammates the Puppies. As for my social life, I remember all of my high school girlfriends distinctly, which is easy to do since there were none. <laughs> In class, I did the minimum to get good grades. Too often, I was a card-carrying member of the Slacker Nation. I was terrified to speak in public and even more scared about going to college. Frankly, it all sounds a bit depressing, Holden Caulfield-like, but it was no different than so many young people's journeys at this critical stage, full of self-doubt. Fortunately, I somehow got into Penn, go Quakers. I had never been to the East Coast before. I made a bunch of friends there who shared my passion for sports, but were quite driven as well. I got taller, less scrawny, slightly, 
I still had plenty of pimples, but things were better. I decided to pursue a dual degree as an English major and also enrolled in Wharton, a stroke of blind luck that would give me a life partner and a career. After graduation, I went to work for a very small investment firm in New York, Blackstone. I started at the bottom, preparing client pitch books, running numbers, and most importantly, making sure the associates had their dinner by 7 p.m. About a year into my job, I was asked to join the firm's fledgling real estate business, and I fell in love with the people I met, the trips to cities I'd never seen, meaning everywhere, the intellectual challenge of making an investment, and the tactile nature of buildings and neighborhoods. Whenever I traveled, I was energized. So many new sights, sounds, foods, differing political and cultural views. A constant feeling of, wow, how did I get here? Mom, I would shout through the payphone. Can you believe it? I'm on a business trip in Hawaii. And yet, as payphones gave way to cell phones, I never lost that sense of awe. I remain amazed and enthused about everything from a warm chocolate chip cookie to visiting number 10 Downing Street. And wherever I go, I send photos in the family group chat like this. <laughs> I can hear my daughters audibly groaning from across the globe, but also quietly smiling. They know that I continue to marvel at the little things and the big ones. A sunny walk on the High Line or your momentous walk across this stage. Even now I'm thinking, Mom, can you believe it? I'm giving the Trinity graduation speech. <laughs> I realize that wonder can sound naive, mushy, an idea we should outgrow because we're savvy, sophisticated New Yorkers. Plus, intellectual cynicism is the currency of the realm. Our country faces immense challenges, so you might as well tweet something dark. But I don't accept that. Cynics and doubters do not change the world. Those who maintain a sense of wonder also maintain an unshakable faith in what is possible. That has been the thread that runs through my story, holding fast to the precious fleeting gifts that I get to savor along the way. It has helped me endure personal embarrassments, terrible business decisions, the miscarriage of a child, and the death of people I have loved intensely. To be clear, wonder does not make antiderivatives any easier to solve or make the situationship you're in suddenly blossom into a relationship. But embracing genuine appreciation for both the ordinary and the extraordinary makes you more resilient in the face of life's inevitable hurdles. So let the word sink in today when congratulations are repeated to you again and again. Do not discount the incredible here and now to rush to the next thing or seek the next jolt of affirmation. Because in doing so, you might lose what now feels like in all its joy, in all its singularity, in all its wonder. My daughters often joke that I only like to watch what they call dad movies, stories about people overcoming insane odds to ultimately win in the end. Think Rocky, Hidden Figures, or Miracle. When that young American hockey team defeats the invincible Soviets and announcer Al Michaels asks, do you believe in miracles? I answer resoundingly, yes, because I've seen my Korean American female rabbi preside over Hanukkah prayers at the White House at the side of a black president. I've seen the pyramids of Egypt, the blue-footed boobies of the Galapagos, and the Statue of Liberty right here in New York Harbor. I saw a smart, warm, beautiful woman in my romantic poetry class at Penn 
who laughed when I asked her out, but who's been making me feel loved and lucky every day since. I saw the breathtaking birth of our children with full heads of curly hair, now miraculously straight. <laughs> I've seen unthinkable scientific advancements in treating HIV, cancer, and heart disease. I've seen how we can make a difference in the lives of children by expanding access to education, opportunity, and health care. I have watched these Trinity graduates overcome the isolating challenges of a pandemic, stuck in little Zoom boxes, still managing to build unbreakable bonds of friendship. I've seen Michelangelo's David and Maya Lin's Vietnam Memorial. I've listened to Beethoven's Fifth and Taylor Swift's all too well, the 10-minute version. <laughs> I've seen the power of a handwritten condolence card or an early morning birthday text. I also know the story of my father losing his mother and brother to a drunk driver when he was just 10 years old, diagnosed with juvenile diabetes at 37 and then suffering from chronic back pain. Nevertheless, he exudes positivity telling us after every meal it's the best he's ever eaten. Or my father-in-law, who recently died at 105 years old, raised in a boy's orphanage, served bravely in two wars. He lost his mother and sister at a young age, and then his daughter and wife to cancer. But despite it all, he expressed thanks to God daily for his blessed existence. I recognize that choosing to live this way takes effort. It's hard to focus on the tasty Big Mac and fries when you feel like a hapless, prepubescent puppy. But like my father and father-in-law taught me, we have to try. It's my North Star. Philosopher Abraham Heschel summed it up perfectly. Our goal should be to live life in radical amazement to get up in the morning and look at the world in a way that takes nothing for granted. Now, I do not deny the poverty, inequity, and suffering in our world. I do not deny the pain of breakups, the unbearable grief of loss, or the persistent anxiety that seems to plague us all. I just affirm that even during the bleakest days of COVID, above the wailing sirens, you could hear the collective clanging of pots cheering on our first responders. Trinity Class of 2023, if you take anything from my remarks, I hope it's a reminder to try to live with radical amazement, to notice what's happening while it's happening, to lift your head from that device, to be in what you're in, to savor, to appreciate, so cheer for each other today. Thank your teachers, hug your parents, your grandparents, and your annoying younger sibling who you secretly adore. Give a thumbs up in some of the endless photos they insist on taking. You can never take too many pictures. Revel in this magical moment. You've achieved something worth celebrating. Remember what you gave Trinity and more significantly, what Trinity gave you. And of course, hold tight to the wonder of it all.